In May 2022, police in Minnesota pulled over a vehicle with a blown tire and a shattered back windshield. Officers could not have imagined that a routine traffic stop would turn into a homicide investigation following the discovery of a six-year-old boy's mutilated remains in the boot of the car. The manner of his death was horrific and the identity of his killer, shocking. This is what happens when a vulnerable child failed by the courts and welfare services designed to protect him is placed into the clutches of a monster. This is the murder of Eli Hart. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. The case that I'm going to cover today, it is so blindsiding. It's really horrific and it leaves me incandescent with rage for multiple reasons. The failures I'm going to outline in this case are astonishing and as far as I'm concerned, unforgivable. I would love to know your thoughts. As ever, thank you so much for joining me. For those of you who are new to my channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So if you like a bit of crime and consistency, this is going to be the channel for you. Let's get started with today's case. And I promise you, by the end of this, I imagine you are going to have frustration, anger, and a sense of residual distress regarding the lessons that will once again suggest need to be learned when it's way too late to learn them. Let's go back to 2021, it's a relatively recent case. We've got 28-year-old Julissa Thorler. Now, at this moment in time, she's in a really acrimonious argument regarding custody for her six-year-old boy. She's in a battle with her ex-partner. So this is the boy's father, 28-year-old Tori Hart. I'm gonna say right from the get-go, Tori Hart is the kind of father that everybody desires to have in their children's lives. Right from the get-go, I mean, I'll explain this a little bit more in detail as we go through, but this man, anybody would choose to have this kind of man as their father. But there's this real battle going on and it's insidious and toxic on the mother's side, on Julissa Thaller's side. Now, the pair had met in 2013. This is when they were young, they were 19 at the time. And like lots of 19 year olds, you think you know everything and this means that the relationship moves quite quickly and they begin living together after just a few months. Now with reflection and insight, the vast majority of us will agree that that is too young to make those decisions, but you can't put an old head on young shoulders as my mother would always say. And the reality means that they think they know what they're doing. And when you've fallen in love, it is an intoxicating experience. And I'm sure that many of us can relate to making horrible decisions about our future when we are far too young to understand what will happen when we do the things that we imagine are great ideas at the time. Now, Thorla had had problems. So since the age of 13, she'd actually been repeatedly hospitalized for issues with her mental health. And the reality is when somebody gets into a position where they need to be hospitalized for their mental health, it is serious. So she has struggled with her mental health issues and these have been repeated episodes. She was apparently somebody who suffered from depression, mood disorder and borderline personality disorder. So she has a host of concerns. Also, we're going to say from the get-go, none of this is why she ends up doing what she does. We're not going to give any license to her actions and excuse them because of her mental illnesses. In fact, we all know that people with mental illnesses are far more likely to harm themselves than anybody else. And we do not acknowledge or accept that this is what leads a killer to be a killer. Actually, killers can also be mentally unwell. Simple as. You might be bad to the core, rotten to the core, but at the end of the day, you can be rotten to the core and also have mental health issues. 
She also had a history of substance abuse, and that's going to add fuel to the fire when you have mental health issues. We can certainly have sympathy for individuals who choose to self-medicate using drugs that are recreationally based or that are illicit, because at the end of the day, if you're in psychological and emotional pain, often those drugs will give you a momentary release and a temporary reprieve from the emotional agony. That said, it's also going to exacerbate and amplify the issues that you are dealing with. Now, when she met Tori, she'd actually been taking a medication. And to be fair, everything tended to be okay when she was taking her medication. But when she becomes pregnant with Eli, which is in 2015, she stops taking her medication. Whether she made a conscious decision to do that, because there are periods of time where she clearly does not want to be on medication, even though she needs to be. Sometimes when somebody gets pregnant, they feel that it's bad for the baby in utero whilst gestating to actually have any kind of chemicals put into their body. Some medications are actually indeed not appropriate when you're pregnant, but If she has serious mental health issues, I'm imagining that they would want to keep her under supervision and on medications that will mean that she has a level of balance because obviously it can be really problematic anyway when you're pregnant, your hormones are everywhere. And we can see that with mums who experience pre and postnatal depression. So I would be surprised if the doctors had been involved in her making the decision to come off her medication. I think it's probably her choice. Now, she also, during this period starts to get involved in what I would say is big red flag behavior and very concerning behavior, which is she starts to make false allegations of abuse against her partner, Tori. So for example, she tells the police that he'd hurt her during an argument and she suggested that he threatened to kill her if she ever left him, but she did actually withdraw the complaint after three days. She even admitted to the police that the reason that she'd said it was because of her mental health issues and that these exacerbated the desire to constantly accuse Tory of things that he hadn't done, which would be absolutely psychologically distressing for Tory. Can you imagine being accused of basic high level domestic abuse? It's going to mean that people look on you in a different way. And we still live in a time, fortunately, where for the most part, if a woman says somebody's being domestically abusive towards them, they're believed. Because for the most part, when women say that, they're telling the truth. But in this case, it's as far from the truth as can be imagined. And so Tori is in a really difficult situation. And after she goes ahead and makes a second unfounded domestic abuse complaint against him, which is the following year, Tori doesn't feel it's safe anymore. So he moves out of the house that they shared and decides that he needs to go it alone. Now, Thorla, in that particular incident, when she makes a complaint against him, says that during this argument, he threatened to kill her with a shotgun. Now, again, that is incredibly damaging. That could cause Tori a huge amount of issues. Now, the police didn't actually pursue the complaint because unsurprisingly, there was insufficient evidence because there was no evidence, because it didn't happen. Note, we are going to be dealing with a pattern of this kind of behaviour, which is deeply damaging, very destructive, and also massively manipulative and unfair. So when they split up, Thorla ends up moving in with her grandmother. And to be fair, she's really manipulative during that period of time. And she's very convincing because her grandmother actually believes all the accounts of abuse that she's talking about, even though there's been no criminal charges and she's actually admitted in the past that she's making it all up. But her grandmother buys into it. I think we can have total sympathy with the grandmother because if somebody you love is telling you these things happen, why would you question it? So Tory, who genuinely wants to be involved with his son's life, he literally doesn't see Thorla until three years later in 2019. This is when she turns up at his sister's wedding. And it seems that for whatever reason, that scenario where she sees him again, it triggers that behavior once more. So this triggers that continuation of Thorla's previous behavior. So at this point, she contacts the police and accuses Tori of putting a nail bomb in her car. Just imagine that. 
a nail one. Domestic terrorism, basically. Now, at the time, the two had been completely uninvolved in one another's lives. They didn't have any contact. They were living two hours apart from one another. And she had, throughout, ensured that Tori had no relationship whatsoever with Eli. Because despite the fact that there were actually no criminal charges laid and filed against Tory, a judge ordered him to stay away from Thorla for two years, which is horrific when you think there's a child involved. Now, it's ironic, given the fact that he's the one being harassed with false allegations by her. This is a topsy-turvy, upside-down clown world when it comes down to the judgments that are made in favour of Thorla and against Tory. Now, whilst that order is still in force, Thorla actually loses custody of a then five-year-old Eli. And the reason that she loses custody is she has a psychotic episode. Now, for those of you who don't know what that will look like, it's a break from reality. It can be incredibly scary for the person going through it. It's incredibly scary for the people who love them also because often they're highly suspicious. Often they feel like you are not actually the human being that you are to them. And it's really difficult to enable that person to see just how poorly they are. And you are not in your right mind to be taking care of a child under any circumstances whatsoever. So because of this, this is in early 2021, the county workers place him in a foster home. And the foster home is with Thorla's sister. She's already got two children of her own at that time. And she's great. She's a great foster parent to him. So he remains there for 11 months. And he just flourishes, absolutely thrives. And this is a really beautiful time for this little boy. He's having a normal childhood, he's happy. And it's also at this point that Eli's father, Tory, he can start building a relationship with his son. Now that's something he has been denied of from the beginning because of these constant false allegations of abuse. And everybody says that from the moment that they were able to reconnect, their relationship just becomes stronger and stronger. Their bond is fusing. And Eli absolutely adored his dad. And his dad doted on him. 100% prioritised him. And bear in mind, his father's in a new life now, in a new situation with a new partner. But he is devoted. He has the hallmarks of being the perfect parent. And he's doing things like taking Eli out to learn to ride a bike, teaching him to fish, doing all the things that a father and son connect over. And Eli loves it. And Tory genuinely goes out of his way to make sure that he starts to organise his own life around when he's going to get to see his son next. And that is so demonstrative of the kind of man that we're going to describe today. And it's why it's so unfair that the failures in the system that I'm going to describe are so present in this case. Because believe me, if Tory had been able to have constant access and ideally custody to this little boy, my tale would not be being told. And that little boy would be living his best life with an incredible family who doted on him. So initially, when this is all happening, Thorla actually says that Tory should actually take over custody of Eli. I do think that the reason that she was probably feeling that way and saying those things is less to do with the rights and the care that she had for Eli and more to do with the fact that she was probably annoyed that her sister had custody. It's only my thoughts about this, but her mindset and her personality and character, certainly to me, she would want to get one up on her sister. I don't think it's because she thinks that Tory's a great guy. I just think that she's probably feeling her nose is out of place because of the fact that her sister's doing such a good job with her son. So she actually describes to the social workers that Tory's a good guy. But of course, this changes really quickly. Of course it does, because she has this previous pattern of behaviour. So whilst Eli's back with Thorla on a trial basis, because obviously... They want to make sure that there is a relationship there with the mother. So this is back in December 2021. She starts the accusations again. She says that Tory is threatening to kill her. There's absolutely no evidence for this. There's no historical reality to this. There's no evidence at all. But she's saying this stuff. So claims he'd told Eli he'd make mummy disappear if she won full custody. Now... That is so abusive, so manipulative and so dangerous, but it's also really destructive if you are fighting for custody. And 
whilst this is all going on, when she's going to be getting her life back on track to prove that she's actually going to be a good mother to Eli, she does the absolute opposite. So she fails to attend the court-ordered mental therapy. She gets thrown off a class that had actually been ordered for her to attend because she had this really strange behaviour. They ended up saying that she couldn't come back. She gets arrested for stealing drugs from a health clinic. And she even tests positive for methadone and Oxycontin. So these are really troublesome drugs because clearly you're not going to be in the right mental state to look after a child when you're high on a high level opioids, for example, and Oxycontin is a hugely high level addictive opioid, which has caused numerous problems and fatalities. But you can see that therefore her priorities are not in the space and place that they should be as a parent. Also, the way that she acts at the drug testing center is so weird, no other way of saying it, that she actually had to find an alternative one. That in itself is demonstrative of somebody who is chaotic, destructive and problematic and is certainly not prioritising her child. She was also made to leave two homes that she was renting because she was really disruptive. And the police attended her property 21 times in 10 months. Now, anybody who's listening to this who works in social care and social services and child protection, massive red flags. We would be looking into that and saying this person is not in a place where they should be looking after a child. They are not acting in a way in accordance to the plan that's been set out by the court. They are under the influence of drugs. They are being highly disruptive and they are also having problems in the places that they live. These are foundational issues that are so problematic that it could cause chaos to a child's life. That is something that is very obvious. Now, in spite of that, during this period, Thorla's being seen to have her son twice weekly because clearly they're building up to the potential of her having a more permanent basis with her son. I don't know why, genuinely, makes little sense to me because it's evidentially clear that she's dangerous. Also, it's worth noting that Eli was actually somebody who had some additional needs as well. So we had this rare genetic condition, it's called Towns-Brock syndrome and Towns-Brock syndrome causes kidney disease, also hearing problems, so he required hearing aids at the time. So he was a child who really required even more love and extra care and attention. But when I say that he would receive literally none from his mother, I feel like it's the biggest understatement I'm ever going to make. Seriously. It's the only word that I can use, but it feels so far removed from the gravity of what we're going to talk about today regarding the lack of care and compassion she showed that child. And it's incredible to me that when she is visiting Eli on those supervised visits because he's in foster care, that she has time to tell him that the reason that he's ended up in foster care, which bear in mind it's very positive for him, he's having a great time, she blames him for it. She says it's because he had locked her out of the house and smeared eggs all over the floor. And she said, that made them come and get you. Now, in truth, He'd been put in the foster care system after Thorla was experiencing psychotic episodes. But what are we seeing? That's evidence of cruel, emotionally and psychologically abusive behaviour that is absolutely asserting blame toward a child. You don't get more cruel than that. Aside from it being an absolute fabrication, which she's good at, she's a liar, she's pathological at the level of lying we're talking about. She's using that part of her character and personality to literally traumatise that child. And Thorla's visits and the horrific behaviour that she was emitting on those visits, it was really detrimental to Eli. So when she'd arrived, he'd go and hide behind furniture. He'd refuse to talk to her. And then after the visits, he'd often wet himself. Now, when you see a child using regressive behaviour, it's not just because they're psychologically traumatised, it's a way of exhibiting to the world around them an emotional struggle. So wetting behaviour is regressive. It means that they are returning to a more childlike state. And when you're in a more childlike state, there is a desperate need for attention and protection. And arguably, that behaviour for those people who love him and care for him in that moment, they can see this is coming from a place of trauma that is directly related to the mother. And that must have been very traumatising for those who cared for him. Tori, at this moment in time, is desperately trying to get custody of his son. 
And because he can see this decline in his behavior, it's really anticipated by him that there's going to be more and more problems unless he gets to care for him. And he's actually considered by officials to be a really strong option for caring for Eli, and rightly so. He's a great guy. They do background checks on him, no concerns at all. And unlike Thorla, one of the characteristics that's very clear about this man is he's stabilizing. He has a presence in Eli's life that lights the child up. Also, as a person in his own life, he'd married, he was really happy, he was in a relationship with his new wife, Josephine, and Josephine got on really well with Eli, she was very loving towards him. They had all the hallmarks of a perfect foundation to offer this child. And what's more important than any of what I've just said is that Eli was really happy and really content in his father's company. He loved being with him, absolutely embraced the time they spent together. And this is down to the fact that Tori was a highly attentive parent. So during the visits, Tori would play with him, would interact with him, he'd buy him all these age appropriate toys, which is about a message to a child, isn't it? It's saying, I see you and I know what will make you happy. And I'm providing some of the things that are gonna do that. So age appropriate toys are fun for the child, but they also give a message of visibility that this child is seen and valued and cared for. The social worker actually noted, during these visits, Eli is noticeably smiling, talkative, energetic, and he seems to enjoy them. Now, I will take issue with one of those words. And the reason I take issue from one of those words is I know that's a positive statement that's been made, but you don't put seems to enjoy them. Seems. Because seems means that there is a question over it. It's potentially just something on the surface. It might not be real. That should have said during these visits, Eli is noticeably smiling, talkative, energetic, and he's enjoying them. That's what a court should see. Because if I have to make a decision over somebody, I don't want questions over their potential. And even that use of a word can be problematic when it comes down to this decision-making process. Now, despite all of these things that are going in Tory's favor, and despite Eli thriving in this situation, this whole idea of Tory taking custody is gonna be a huge uphill struggle. And I'll tell you why. Because I had to look into this, because when I first surfaced, sketched this research, I couldn't quite get my head around the reality of what I was seeing. But now I've looked in depth at the system in Minnesota, and let me tell you, it is massively in favor of the mother, massively. So just to give you an example, if the couple have never been married, and that was in the case here, the fathers have no custodial rights at all, unless the courts award them. Even though they are half of that child's creation, and they'll be financially liable for a child, they literally have no rights at all. It has to go through the court process, even, and this is gonna blow your mind, when there is clear evidence that the father is far better suited to care for the child. Yeah, it's still more difficult in that circumstance to remove custody from the mother. You can be a lesser parent, a more challenging parent, a more emotionally unstable parent, but if you're female and the mother, they're gonna award in your favor 90% of the time. Where is the logic in that? Surely the interest of the child should be paramount. And we have a lot of problems in the UK, but the Children's Act 1989 is very, very clear regarding safeguarding. And that means that the needs and wishes of the child are paramount. Their needs and also their desires play a huge part into where custody is created and the decisions behind that custody creation is based on what the child's interests and best interests are. And it feels like it doesn't happen when I'm looking at the system in Minnesota. In the UK, for example, these days, there's a 50-50 split. So if a mother and father split up, then the child has 50% of the time with the dad, 50% of time with mum, unless they wanna argue it differently because maybe their life leads them to not want to have that kind of arrangement. Also, where there are issues with abuse, etc. That means that there are gonna be questions over a parent's fitness to be a parent. But it feels like in Minnesota, this isn't really taken into consideration as it should be weight-wise when it comes down to the protection of children. Now, as soon as Thorla learns that Tori wants to take custody, that's it. It's like 
it sparks that old behavior yet again. So she just starts to block all of his efforts. And how does she do it? Well, she reverts to type. So she just starts making up more allegations of domestic abuse against him. She files literally multiple requests for protective orders. So she'll claim that he's hurt her, he's hurt Eli, all of them absolutely, utterly unfounded. Even Thorla's own mother said that this man does not have a bad bone in his body. And we have to remember this, when I'm criticizing Thorla today, and boy, I am gonna criticize this monster. I am not gonna stop criticizing this monster. And I know that psychologically there isn't a term in diagnostics for monster, but believe me, she fully fits it. The family around Thorla actually care deeply about this little boy, and they aren't standing in the way of Tory because he is a really good guy and they know what's right for this child. So I don't want the criticism to apply to Thorla's wider family. Now, despite Thorla, at this point and in the past, even admitting that a lot of these claims were untrue, what happens, because again, the system is screwed, is they immediately block Tory's custody attempts. And because she's made these claims, aside from blocking the custody attempts because of all this problematic behavior, what it also does, it prevents him from obtaining any public assistance in his custody fight. And that makes this situation ill affordable for him. Can you imagine the amount of money that you're gonna to have to spend in a custody battle and all she needs to do is fabricate and suddenly the opportunity to access the money that's required so you can protect your child, it's cut. Off. It's completely bizarre. A mother with a history of abusive behavior is literally allowed to make completely unfounded allegations against Tory, and in so doing so, his efforts to do something are blocked. Literally, his efforts to protect his child are lost. How is that in the interests of the child? I mean, it's fundamentally the worst system ever, isn't it? And yet this exists. And the case I'm talking about today wouldn't exist if those blockers and those biases did not occur. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about a child who's lost their life and they've lost their life partly to do with a really unfair system. Thola is highly manipulative. She's highly narcissistic. She knows exactly how to work the system. She even went so far, because she is so narcissistic, to write personal letters to the judges who are dealing with the case. Amazing, she says that she is. Fantastic, she says that she is in these letters. She's a great parent. Always puts her son first, she claims. This is absolutely ludicrous, of course. And the one thing I would think if I was a judge is, self-praise is no recommendation. That's the saying and that's what she's doing. I'm not gonna listen to some mother who thinks it's acceptable to write to me, basically saying how fabulous she is. That is gonna pang of absolute egocentricity without a shadow of a doubt. She is absolutely determined, however, in these actions to get custody of Eli. She doesn't care about the cost, it's about winning. And I really mean that throughout this case, that's what really resides within me. I'd be interested to see what you guys think, but it's winning. It's not about this child being a priceless person that enhances their life. It's that Eli is a weapon, a pawn to be used against Tori. That's how it feels. It's that sense of, if I can't have things my way, no one's gonna have this little boy their way. And I feel that throughout this case, and it's so distressing. Now, in February 2022, the judge actually denies Thola's request for another protection order against Tory. Says there's literally no evidence to support it. At this point, why are they not arresting her? Genuinely, it should be criminal, and indeed it will be criminal in other areas where somebody is wasting police time, harassing innocent men, and basically making up violent complaints against somebody at cost of their life, their psychological well-being, and also the opportunity they have to protect their own child. She's doing all of those things, so why isn't she being arrested? And despite this getting thrown out, she just goes ahead, files another restraining order, just in a different county the next month, 
Now, again, that is subsequently dismissed on the 4th of May 2022, but that does not matter to Thorla, and I'll tell you why it doesn't matter to Thorla, and this is why it's so frustrating, and this is why the system is so critically broken. She managed to achieve what she wanted, because despite having zero evidence against Tory, she'd managed to block his attempts to get custody of his son. And even the social workers who were involved in the case said that they noted that she was almost fixated and obsessed with these numerous false allegations against him that they could see dated back literally years. And at the same time as them being concerned about clearly her manipulative, dangerous behaviour that should have been like so bright, red flag orientated that she wasn't within a hundred feet of her own son. There were other people who were raising concerns constantly. So numerous people made statements to Child Protective Services saying that if Thorla got Eli where full custody was concerned, they thought that she'd harm him. Now I say in these videos, risk offending. And so often people don't risk offending and then we find out that children die because people failed to alert the services of the horrible things that were happening. Not in this case. Numerous people close to Eli and to Thorla said something terrible is going to happen if you send this child home with her. The services ignored them. Now, when you get a door slammed in your face, when it comes down to safeguarding a child... Those individuals are so innocent of what happens next, but they must have it lay heavy on their conscience that they were trying desperately to get people to listen to them in the services that were meant to do so, and they didn't. They just didn't take them seriously. And on the 17th of March, 2022, her behavior gets even more bizarre. So we already have all these concerns being raised. We already have all these false allegations. And then suddenly, She's out buying a shotgun. And she actually tells her boyfriend, a guy called Robert Pickerainin, that she wants to know how to shoot. So being the good boyfriend, and probably not for one minute, imagining that he was living with a chameleon predator, and he actually agrees to take her to a shooting range for the next following two days. Now, first of all, what is a woman who has all of these instability issues doing with a shotgun? She shouldn't have one anywhere near her. I am not for one minute saying that in the States, for example, somebody who has a mental illness should not be allowed a gun. I appreciate there is an amendment that makes it clear you have a right to bear arms, but we should absolutely note whether an individual who has access to a gun could actually cause major issues with it. And certainly her history of false allegations, really severe mental instability and relatively abusive behavior that in itself should deny her access to this kind of horrific weapon. I don't know whether any of you who are listening are aware of shotguns and the damage they do, but basically you don't have to have a great aim to hit them. That's how big the blast is and how destructive the holes are. So we get to the 10th of May, 2022. You would think at this point, their services have so many red flags, there is no way that Thorla is ever gonna get custody of her son again. Wrong. They literally award legal custody of Eli back to her. Now, I've looked this up and behind this, what can only be described as freaking baffling, as well as unbelievably dangerous decision, was taken by Dakota County Judge Tim Wormager. So he was one of four judges who was kind of overseeing the case. And the reason that he decided to literally send this little boy back into the arms of a wolf was because he'd taken advice. So he said, oh, took advice. And that was from Beth Denner, who's a Dakota County social worker. And also I took advice off Eli's court appointed guardian. I have no idea why a judge would not look at the actual case file in full and think, well, these two are obviously smoking crack to make that kind of decision because there is nothing in her history that would suggest that she is the right person to be looking after this child. And by the way, I have this amazing father who has the hallmarks of everything we could ever desire for a father. But no, that doesn't happen. And the reason that they had recommended that she gets to have 
custody on a full-time basis again is because she'd been taking a medication for the past six months. And also, she'd taken Eli to his medical and therapy appointments. Yes, apparently, that's all there is to being an adequate parent. Just take your medication, turn up at the doctor's on time, and all that other behaviour that we've got evidence of, it just disappears. And so the social worker concluded there were no concerns about Eli's safety in Thorla's care. Did she live with him? Did she spend lots of time around him? No. But the people who did, they informed social services how terrified this little boy was whenever his mum turned up. That he regressed in his behaviour. That he hid. I mean, how on earth can you say that you believe that therefore that relationship is a safe one? Evidential in the child's actions, it is not. And the problem is with that decision, not only is she going to be mistaken, it's going to cost a little boy's life. And to me, I find that struggle to forgive, I really do. I appreciate that it's really difficult for social workers to make decisions and there must be a way of responsibility that at times is almost unbearable and people do make the wrong calls. They do and it's not because they're terrible human beings but I don't get this one at all. I don't get how anybody calls it with all the evidence that is absolutely clear in this case. So now we have Eli back with his mother and he moves into the apartment with Thorla in a place called Farmington, which is in Dakota County, Minnesota. I dread to think what kind of environment he was living in. And all we see is a continuation of Thorla's horrific behaviour. She's disruptive. She's constantly screaming in the house. And the police are actually at her house at least twice a week. They have the ambulance there regularly because she's constantly claiming that she's collapsed or fallen ill. The neighbours start complaining of the fact there's always banging and screaming coming from the property. And another thing that is really devastating just to listen to and to connect with is the fact that as soon as he goes home, Eli's behaviour just starts to really deteriorate. And it coincides perfectly with her getting the custody. So he starts hitting, he starts biting, he starts wetting his pants. And this is a way of a child expressing their pain. This is a way of telling the authorities just by his behaviour, I am struggling, please notice me. Children don't know how to communicate this abuse, so their body does it for them. The authorities should have been picking up on this, that Thorla is not a fit mother and that we're seeing regressive behaviour and that regressive behaviour is evidence of an unfit parent abusing a child. Now his father, Tori, he's also speaking to child welfare services. He's saying, look, my son's behaviour is just deteriorating. It's deteriorating quickly. He was saying he was having trouble sleeping. He was showing signs of anxiety. He was using baby talk. He was chewing his shirt and he was stuttering. God, honestly, Sometimes you just want a time machine, don't you? Because let me tell you, I've worked in this field for a very, very long time. I've worked in safeguarding. If somebody tells me that this regression is occurring, the first thing I'm going to be looking at is, okay, what is happening in the wider life? What are the changes? Because that's a big one. What are the feelings of the parent who are seeing this decline to kind of identify whether they've got their own thoughts? Not that you take that 100% seriously, because of course they could be malicious, but certainly the evidence of Tory is that he's only ever been a great influence. So I'm going to listen to that evidence and I'm going to take it really seriously in that moment. And if I'm going to witness that child and I'm going to speak to his educators who are also witness that, witnessing that child and I see that this is consistent with what they're knowing, I'm instantly going to be raising concerns because regressive behaviour is always linked to emotional instability, anxiety, stress and fear. And fear. And I definitely can see in those behaviours, he's expressing terror. A Tory, as a dad, is very insightful. He knows this child is being emotionally and mentally abused. Now, unbelievably, what does Thorla do? Well, he just does the classic. He puts all the blame for Eli's concerning behaviour back onto Tori. 
even though we all know that Tori is just a massively positive influence in his life. And Thorla is one of the most toxic individuals that any child could have the misfortune to meet. Now within days, and it is only days of Thorla regaining custody, the judge actually reopened the case. And that's because there are new concerns about this child's safety and well-being. But of course, we now have Thorla with a shotgun. And over the course of the following week on CCTV, they see her taking the shotgun in and out of the apartment numerous times. It's basically hid in a grey blanket, but that's what she's doing. And what do we know about that kind of behaviour? It's rehearsal. She's taking it in and out to prep herself for what she's clearly premeditating. She's clearly planning. She's clearly getting used to actually carrying out that kind of behaviour, being with the gun, getting it into the car and out of the car. And there's only one reason for that. The malevolent, monstrous nature within her that's growing. So we get to the 19th of May, 2022. Now, according to Thorla's boyfriend, Robert, Thorla and Eli were arguing that evening. I think that that is a really bad way to describe it. A young child is not arguing with a parent. A parent is not knowing how to manage a scenario of communication with a child. There should be no escalation with a young child because as an adult, you're in charge and a child is allowed to express how they feel, even inappropriately at that point. They're children. You don't get into a situation where you have a full-on row with them. Apparently as well, the reason that Eli was arguing with his mother is he didn't want to go to sleep. And I immediately am drawn to the fact that so many children who are in psychological distress and trauma do not wish to sleep because they go through horrible night terrors. They don't want the light off. They just want to stay awake because at least awake, they can control the trauma to some degree. And that makes me feel really sad because this little boy is obviously having that sleep disturbance because this woman who's meant to be protecting him makes him feel so unsafe. Now, in response to that, Thorla takes her shotgun, wraps it in that gray blanket and then puts it in a car. Then she apparently grabbed Eli, takes him downstairs and Robert at this point says that he didn't see Thorla again until the next morning, which was the 20th of May, 2021. But of course, for Robert, he's not going to be imagining for one second that something terrible is going to happen to Eli because he's in love with this woman. He feels that she's a sweet person. I've listened to some of the things that he said before she's actually tried. And he describes her as a really sweet and kind person. He's completely wrong. She's a heinous human being and a horrendous predator. But the point is for him, he's not going to be debating with himself whether she's a safe person or otherwise because he believes that she's safe, full stop. Now, he questions her and says, you know, where did you go? And she said that she just had to go out to sort something out. Now, later that day, bear in mind, this is just 10 days after she regains custody of Eli. The scenario plays out that the police noticed her driving her car. She's driving this Chevrolet Impala and they can see there are some things wrong with the vehicle. So they pull her over for a routine traffic stop as they do. And this is in Orono, which is west of Minneapolis. And instantly they can see that one of the tires was blown out so she's driving on the wheel rim, which is dangerous. But also they can see that the back windshield has literally been destroyed. And sadly, the reason for this is going to become horrifyingly clear shortly. Now, when she gets out of the vehicle, the officer notices that she's got blood on her hand. Also, there was blood in the actual back of the vehicle. Now, it's at this point that she claims that the reason for that is that she's had a tampon that she's removed and obviously it's bled everywhere. With respect to that officer, I appreciate how awkward those conversations are, but have you been around any women? Because if there is blood all over the car and all over her hands and actually in her hair as well, I'm going to be calling 911, getting her an ambulance, because at the end of the day, that ain't normal, you know? Periods can be heavy, but not to the point where literally it's like a murder scene. But you can see that that's a manipulative way of operating, isn't it? Because she probably senses that it's going to make it awkward for the person questioning on what she's actually saying. 
But what they also notice, and that's even more concerning, is there is a shotgun shell and an empty casing in the back. Also, what appears to be a bullet hole in the back seat. Now, obviously, at this point, the officers are disturbed and they feel that there's probable cause to actually impound and search the vehicle. And you would think I would also state that they then get her into a car under arrest, drive her to a station and keep her there until they figure out what's going on. No, though. Initially, Thorla is literally released from the scene and to add insult to injury in that how to do the worst police investigation at the onset, full stop, they drive her home. Yeah. Now, just imagine that situation if it had been a man who they pulled over. You know, without a shadow of a doubt, they would have kept them because they would have been concerned that a crime had been played out. But anyway, they don't. They take her home, drop her off like a taxi service, and this is when they take the car to be looked at. They do this subsequent search of the vehicle, and it's horrific. It's the most horrific thing they could have ever imagined because in the boot of a car, wrapped in a grey blanket, that very same blanket that she's been taking the gun in and out, are the remains of Eli's mutilated body. And the word mutilated underestimates the description. There is not another one that I can essentially use that's going to exemplify what I'm talking about. I suppose obliterated may also connect with the reality of what I'm discussing. Now, next to him, that's where the shotgun's been placed. Also, when they look in the back seat, and I have no idea what the first officer who met her was thinking, because they look in it and it's literally covered in blood and brain matter, and they've let her go home. They've literally driven her back to her own address. Now, of course, police at this moment are horrified and they immediately go to Thorla's apartment. But of course, what's happened? She's not stayed there, has she? Has she? Heck, she knows that they're going to find the body of her little boy. So she has done one straight away. Also, they notice that the washing machine is running. And of course, that washing machine has all the clothes that she'd been wearing when she'd been stopped earlier. That can be catastrophic for a case. We are talking about the fact that in certain situations, that might have prevented an individual finally being brought to justice. In this case, it won't. But the point is, that's a catastrophic error. It really is. And I feel like that's the one thing that is consistent throughout this, a failure of services per se. Now, thankfully, the police don't take that long to actually locate her. She's leaving the area on foot at this point in time. And when the arresting officers find her, they're instantly drawn to the fact that they can see blood and brain matter in her hair. Excellent work there by the initial officers who failed to spot this and let her go and drove her home. Now, she comes out with a pile of bull. Of course she does, because she says, oh, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. I got this from a deer that I bought from the butchers. I have no idea how that conversation would have gone. What's in your hair? Oh, this is going to seem really weird. <laughs> but I bought a deer, a full deer, a full deer, a really big full deer, a huge deer from the butchers. What butchers? I don't. No, I actually don't know. There's no recollection of which butchers. Okay, what did you do next? Well, it's a strange thing. It turns out that the deer exploded. The deer exploded? How else can I explain this blood and brains in my hair? Honestly, that's what she said. I'm not saying about they exploded, I'm taking artistic license with that, but you can imagine, can't you, being a police officer, and they are suspecting straight away, the people who've picked her up at this point, that there was something really malevolent that's happened, but they are listening to her just reel off lies, and that's in context with this pathological liar. This is the kind of person we're talking about today. And you would think at this point she'd be banged to rights, admitting it, this is what I've done, but no. When she gets to the police station, she's tight-lipped, but also she makes everything about herself. So she refuses to be pictured until she's specifically styled her hair for her mugshot. And it looks awful, still. So try harder. Sorry, 
bit of my sarcasm coming out, but it really, really provokes me, this particular case, and the fact that she is so narcissistic that she's actually caring about what she looks like in a mugshot just speaks volumes about her personality type and character. Now, the police are obviously desperate at this point to figure out what on earth has happened that day to track her movements. So they start speaking to the public. They start trying to figure out exactly what her route was. Of course, she had that blown out tyre. So she's been driving on the rim. And that's quite convenient because the rim's actually made a mark on the road because it's been dragged that way. And this means that they can kind of trace it in lots of different areas. Also, her vehicle had been spotted at a petrol station, and that was shortly before she was actually being pulled over. Now, bear in mind, at the point that she is seen at that petrol station, she's next to an industrial bin. And when they search that bin, they've just got more and more grisly finds. So they've got a bloodstained backpack that was his, that little boy's backpack, had his homework in. They found fragments of bone, they found brain matter. And then as they go around tracing where the car has been, it's just more and more locations where blood and brain matter have been discarded. Then they find another industrial bin and it's got Eli's bloody child booster seat and it had actually been damaged by the shotgun blast. And like literally when they're looking at these images and when they're seeing what she's been doing, she was scooping out this baby's brain matter and blood and just throwing it away just like she threw him away because that's what we're talking about we're talking about somebody who believes that they have ownership of a human being and can do at will what they want like i said for me this is a woman who just wants to win she doesn't care about the consequences she just wants to hurt the people that she feels want to take something that she believes she owns when they do the autopsy obviously it's catastrophic and it's obvious how he's died they establish that Thorla had actually blasted Eli nine times with a shotgun at point blank range. I'm sure that some of you in the States and countries where you are more afraid with guns won't need any description of what that will have done to his body. But for those of you who know less about guns, believe me, there's not going to be a lot left. If you shoot somebody at point blank range with a shotgun, you are going to literally decimate their body. He was sat when she did that in the back seat of her car in his booster seat. She also specifically went for the head and the torso. She'd actually reloaded that weapon multiple times between rounds. Imagine doing that to a little boy, actually taking the time to reload again and again and again and watching the impact and devastation of each shot and not stopping, just carrying on. Eli's little body had been obliterated. When investigators actually were able to trace the shot where she'd bought the ammo from, she'd even gone so far as to ask the staff who sold them her which ammunition would blow the biggest hole. I don't know about you, but I feel that somebody who wishes to ask those questions and then carries out such a heinous crime should be given maybe a unique perspective of how big the holes are. When I don't know, they receive the firing squad. Sorry, I'm triggered. Can't get it out of my head. What happened to that little boy? Can't get it out of my head. A mother reloading a gun. Time and time and time again and the fact that she actually went out of her way to ask people in that shop what would do the most damage is there a hole deep enough in hell that can literally take this human being and give her what she deserves they were also able to establish where he was killed so she'd taken him to this remote lake minnetonka regional car park which is in minatrista that's where she'd actually carried out the shooting. And you can't imagine where Eli would be in that moment. You know, he has no concept of this person, yes, that he's terrified of, but he has no concept of her potential. She just drives him here and destroys him. Now, initially, a now 28-year-old Thorla is charged with six-year-old Eli's second-degree murder. I do not get this at all. Honestly, 
there is no way it's second degree. I'm imagining that there is some reasoning behind potentially her mental instability and that's why they're doing it. They're like, oh, she definitely knew she was doing it, but she's still not necessarily in the greatest of mental health. Therefore, we'll say that she wasn't fully aware of her actions. But for me, it makes no sense. And ironically, on this occasion, her narcissism is something we can all celebrate because when she's offered two plea deals from prosecutors, which would basically carry a maximum 40-year sentence because that's the maximum amount for a secondary green murder conviction, she rejects them. She's like, I am innocent. In fact, she said, I would never do that to my son. I want to go to trial. And I can imagine the prosecution were like, yes, we should definitely go to trial. We should go to trial. Even though we've offered these plea deals, the fact that she now wants to suggest that she's innocent and go to trial, we are 100% behind that because our case is so rock solid that literally we've thought about asking Jack from the canteen to present it for us because that's how little we're going to need to do in the weight of the evidence that is so clearly demonstrating her guilt. It's actually astonishing that this woman could for one minute say that she is innocent. I also appreciate some people looking in and saying, well, isn't that evidence of the fact that she is mentally unstable, that she's given this opportunity to walk free at some point in the future and she says no? Personally, no, I don't buy into it. I think a narcissism is the issue here. I think she believes that she is above the law. Bear in mind her previous behavior, how she creates situations and feels that she has a control of the law because she has blocked custody on so many occasions. It's worked for her that she's just doing more of it now. So because of that, she subsequently is charged with first degree murder. And this means that the case goes to trial, which is horrific. She should have just pleaded guilty and it should have been first degree as far as I'm concerned. Because, of course, when it goes to court, the family have to manage seeing what they're going to see. And it's beyond traumatising. Now, she has been found mentally fit at this state as well. So be aware that they do believe that she is fit to actually be on trial and that her mental instability is not the reasoning behind her actions. So we get to February 2023. I'm telling this in April 2023. So it's literally just happened. Now, Thorla's attorney has the audacity, and I mean the audacity, to actually request that she be allowed to leave the courtroom whenever graphic or emotional evidence is presented during the trial. I mean, what is that attorney doing? No, you don't get to walk out when you have to see the horrible bits that everybody else has to see. When you have to see the damage that you caused shown to other people. You don't get to walk away from that. You deserve every second of the feelings that that might provoke if you have any feelings, because I'm not sure that this woman is human anyway. Anyway, the judge is like, no, it's a no. It's a no from me. In fact, we're just going to have a round robin of 10 independent individuals walking down the street. Oh, they've all said no as well. Actually, one of them said something about a firing squad. But obviously, she isn't in charge of the world, so we can't appreciate that position, although we do think she has a point. Anyway... The judge says no, and even the prosecutor, who is there, obviously, to prove that this woman's banged to rights and that she's guilty as hell, they purposely limit the amount of graphic evidence during the trial. This is including the autopsy photos as well, and that means that that prosecutor is concerned about the impact that that kind of material can have on the individuals attending the trial. And bear in mind, these prosecutors, they are dyed in the wool. They have seen crime scene photos. They have worked with heinous cases. But this is what he said. They are horrible, as bad as I have ever seen in any case. I don't want to see them again. The family doesn't want to see them again. And even though they didn't show the worst material, the actual evidence proved so disturbing that all of the jurors were offered cancelling. I think we can all agree that that in itself demonstrates the level of heinous action by this woman who should have been a protective influence in her son's life. Now, whilst the motive for the killing wasn't certain, what the prosecution did was they posed three circumstances, essentially, that could have led to it. So her mental health struggles was one, to get life insurance was another, because believe me, she had been in touch with people asking about how to get quite a few hundred thousand dollars in life insurance for a child. She was denied it because you don't get that level of insurance for children. But she was trying. And of course, the third one was the custody battle that she was in. 
I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's number three. I think she would have liked the insurance to pay out to her as well. So she could benefit financially as well as emotionally by knowing that she'd won in this situation in the, if I can't have him, no one else can have him, even though I don't want him situation. And when they did a historical search on her digital devices, they found that she'd just searched for horribly incriminating areas. And it is awful to imagine that she was doing this in a spare time. So she'd search things like, how much blood can a six year old lose? Payments of insurance if child dies. How to commit crime and blame a child. And what length am I allowed to saw off a shotgun barrel? I mean, all of those are so contextual with what we're talking about. Now, whatever her motive was and whatever one of those three or all of those three present in reality, the point is that all of the evidence was absolutely overwhelming. It was absolutely substantial beyond belief. There was no way she was going anywhere. She was always going to be found guilty. It's as simple as that. So not only is Eli's body a murder weapon being found in her car, of course, we know this. And also she had blood and pieces of her son's brain all over her, basically in her hair, etc. But on top of this, her mobile phone that had actually linked to places where she was involved in the killing of him. Now, her defense lawyer, who I think we can all agree was probably sitting there going, I have no defense. My best hope was a plea deal for second degree murder. I would have felt I'd done a good job there. But no, this woman wants me to go for a case where she's presenting herself as innocent. And I have literally not one thread of potential for her being innocent. How can I present this case? Hmm, how can I present this case? I'll say, yes, she was certainly present when her son was killed, but she didn't kill him. I mean, instantly you're gonna go, well, who did? We don't know. We just know that because you didn't see her do it, that she didn't do it. But we did see her at various locations removing brain matter and blood from the car and disposing of things that were associated with the killing. But did you see her actually doing the killing? No, but in pretty much 99% of murder cases, you don't see the person actually doing the killing. So how do you know they did the killing? The weight of forensic evidence and people being seen at the scene of the crime. That's a good point, but I'm still gonna go with the reality of you didn't see her do it. That's my defense. And I imagine the prosecution were like, I actually feel sorry for the person in charge of the defense because there is no defense. But that's exactly what they're doing, that she wasn't the person that shot Eli because there were no messages, there were no witnesses, there were no images, there was no footage that actually linked her to the specific killing. So they claim that while she might have aided and abetted the killing, she hadn't pulled the trigger, even though there was no one else in the frame and there was no one else in the car and there was no one else in a custody battle and there was no one else having been abused with this child apart from her. And even though she is 100% covered in forensic evidence that demonstrates that she did it, but hey, you didn't see her pull the trigger. Could you imagine if that was the standard basis for getting a conviction? Very few people would be in prison now, wouldn't they, convicted of murder? Because, I'm sorry, a defence is you need it on CCTV to actually say that this person was the person who did it. Absolutely makes no sense at all whatsoever. They also didn't call Thorla, so they didn't get her to testify in her own defence because she would have obviously tripped up. She's a massive liar. The defence wouldn't have been able to prevent the jury from seeing that. And they didn't actually call any other witnesses as far as to defend her and to stand up for the reality of what they're trying to put forward, which is that she didn't kill her son. Why? Because there would be a whole host of individuals that would just be queuing up to discredit that individual. And can you imagine the cross-examination of any witnesses who stood in that box? There are witnesses, of course, who are there for the defense because everything she's saying is a lie. So we get to the 8th of February, 2023, and wow, jury takes less than two hours. 
to deliberate before they come back with a verdict. And we all know when the jury takes less than two hours, which means they've had a coffee and a sandwich during knowing what they're going to say, and they just want to make it look like they've paid lip service to considering all possibilities regarding whether there is any reasonable doubt, you know they're coming back with the strong reality of the verdict. And it is. So they find Thorla guilty of Eli's first degree murder. Of course they do. It was always going to be that way. We then get to the 16th of February, 2023, and wow, again, I know it's not acceptable to do things like throw things at the individuals who've been found guilty, but there is a part of me that always feels there'll be a great satisfaction at every individual within the courtroom being allowed just one aim. So prior to the sentence being passed, there are obviously victim impact statements read. And you'd think that Thorla at this moment in time would be listening and be remorseful and be thinking about the heinous action that she has carried out to steal the sanctuary of that childhood, the sanctity of that life and the future of that little boy in the arms of people who love him. So they stand up to read this in front of her to hopefully provoke some kind of reaction. And it's including his father, Tori, and his father's partner. And they make heart-wrenching statements that are just absolutely devastating to listen to and during it as opposed to showing any emotion whatsoever she just stood there completely impassively and you'd think that she was bored to be fair at some points and when she is finally asked if she's got anything to say she replies this i'm innocent fuck you all you garbage that is all your honor i mean we could argue that she does at least call him your honor but I feel at that moment in time, in the UK, a court judge, they have this little hammer and it's to call order and they bang it when they need silence. I do feel that a judge in such circumstances should be allowed three goes at aiming directly at the head of the perpetrator who's been found guilty and is being disrespectful in that moment. I know it's not something that is in statute. I'm just throwing it out there. I think it would be a very satisfying experience, particularly if over the years the judge got very, very accurate. But like I said, there's no apology, just more abuse. And even her own attorney, when she swears at the courtroom and denies her guilt, they flinch. You can see that that defence attorney just doesn't feel that she's acting in an appropriate manner. And actually the judge says, you know, that is not appropriate language. Ms. Stoller, you have a right to speak this morning if you'd like. You don't have any obligation to speak, but if you'd like to choose to speak, now is the time to do it. Yes, I would like to say something. Go ahead. Um, I'm innocent. Fuck you all. You're garbage. That's all your honor. Ms. Stoller, I you know, don't know that that's appropriate here. Um, Sorry, I told you what somebody else can. What I would say is... And she said, Sorry, I told you what somebody else can't. Well, we would like an hour in a room with you telling you what other people haven't told you. Because believe me, there's a list of people who want to make it clear how we feel about your actions, Thorla. Now, when it gets to the sentencing, Thorla was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Amen to that. That is a great thing. I am so glad. I hope that she spends every single day haunted by the images. I hope her night is broken by insomnia because all she can see is the reliving of what she did to that little boy. I hope that he haunts her every waking and sleeping second until the moment that she takes her last breath and then she is accompanied by the devil himself to a place that she will remain to burn in hell eternally. That's my feelings about this woman. When the judge actually summed up and gave their statement about their feelings towards this case, they said, the worst thing that seems to happen to a parent is to lose a child. It's worse though when you don't lose your child to something like cancer or an accident. It's when someone takes that child from the world. What I can't imagine, what nobody can imagine, is that the person that takes that child from the world is the person that brought that child in. Nothing I do would bring justice to this situation. And he's right. It doesn't matter how long she gets inside. It doesn't matter how horrendous her life is. It doesn't matter whether she is indeed haunted by the images of what she did to that poor boy. It's the fact that he's still dead. It's the fact that he still isn't in the arms of the loving family that he could have been in. It's the fact that Tori is denied his son. It's all of those things that just 
create a chaos within my psyche expressing this and I can't imagine the chaos it creates in those who adored this little boy and have to live with how he died. Now you would think that Thorla would actually be somebody in that moment who cracked a little, who realised just a little that she needed to express some kind of remorse, but no. In a pathetic, petulant, childish way, what did she do? She just gave the court the finger whilst the sentence was passed. And she actually disguised it as if it was scratching her face. And again, you can't add any years on. She's going down forever, but I feel like there should be more of a punitive reality to the kind of actions that she takes and that she emits. So I feel that there should be something weighted towards her as an additional punishment where she shows absolutely no respect to the court. She is guilty as hell, and yet she feels that she has a right to still try to control the circumstances. Now, there is one thing that is abundantly clear in what I've talked about today, and that is that child protective services in Minnesota are clearly broken. And don't get me wrong, they're broken in lots of places in the world. I appreciate that it's not just there. And I do have some sympathy and empathy and understanding towards the fact that still in certain places, there is a bias towards the fact that women get more opportunities for custody battles in their favour. And I guess that's on account of the fact that it's still considered that you have a natural maternal connection with a child. But when it comes down to that bias, literally transcending logic, common sense and evidence, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It just puts a child at risk. Thorla was manifestly unfit to care for Eli, manifestly. Again, a word that underestimates what needs to be said in this case. This is a woman who had a really serious history of mental illness, but she also had that combined with drug abuse. So the stability is fractured. She had this really unstable and erratic lifestyle, and that's completely non-conducive to a child's healthy development. And Eli, the most important person in this case, clearly demonstrated that he wasn't happy in her care. And that should have been the biggest red flag. He didn't want to be there because she was horrible to him. And there were obvious, obvious signs that warned us of the potential of her harm and warned us that if she was left to her own devices, horrible things could befall Eli. Also, the physical actions of Eli, the fact that he was regressing, he was biting, he was wetting, he was doing all of these things that were shouting out that he was struggling. And meanwhile, while this is all going on, we've got Eli's biological father, Tori, his own flesh and blood, who's fully willing, able, and completely the right person to care for this little boy. There were absolutely zero concerns about his capacity to be a dad. And more importantly, Eli was absolutely thriving and happy when he was with him. But thanks to Thorla and actually the system in general, as opposed to receiving custody of his gorgeous little boy and being able to watch him as he thrived into his future. Instead, he was given Eli's ashes. That's how he got his child back. He got them back in the form of ashes after his son's brutal, unnecessary and totally horrific murder. As opposed if I want to be really empathetic and stretch my level of understanding and sympathy, I could say that Thorla was also failed. I mean, she was somebody who had her personal demons. She'd obviously struggled heavily with mental illness. And whilst she did take medication and at times that worked, it doesn't feel like she was given the treatment that she actually needed. She probably should have been institutionalized. She probably should have been in for long-term care. She probably should have been treated in a much more supervised way. All the warning signs were there. And if they'd taken that step, I wouldn't be telling this story. It would have saved Eli's life. But the truth is that Thorla committed this horrific offense, not because she was mentally unwell. Yes, she may have been mentally unwell, as a human being, she may have had mental instability, but that's not why she killed that little boy. It's not. Thorla committed this horrific offence because I believe she wanted to win. She wasn't going to let anybody have that boy. And she wanted to punish people for even daring to believe that they would have a right to do so. And so she punished them in the most tragic and terrifying of ways. And also in a very effective way. 
because believe me, everybody who loved that child has to live with that nightmare day in, day out. Now, following Eli's tragic death, Tori and his family wanted to provide legacy. So they wanted to raise money to build a playground in his name at Surfside Beach in Mound, Minnesota. It's where Eli really loved to go and fish with his dad. And we were so moved by this that we donated to the GoFundMe page. I'm going to leave a link. So if any of you feel moved to do the same, that would be very much appreciated. Tory has also, understandably and rightfully so, launched a lawsuit against Dakota County Social Services for their woeful, and that again doesn't describe the level that we should go to with this, but it's a word that is descriptive enough. It's a woeful handling of Eli's case. It's a disturbing, despicable handling of Eli's case because it placed him in direct path of harm, which enabled his mother to get custody of him despite the countless warning signs. Eli was a really happy little boy when he was with his dad, with his whole life ahead of him. He's full of energy. He loved animals. He actually dreamed of becoming a fireman. And his future was taken away from him by the very person whose role it was to care and love and protect him. And everyone could see that he was in imminent danger. Every single person looking in, apart from the services that were meant to protect him aside from those who were ultimately making the decisions over his custody arrangements. And that is truly appalling. It's blindsiding to cover a case that had so many opportunities to prevent the outcome of what I've discussed today. My heart absolutely goes out to Tory and his family and all those affected by the death of this absolutely gorgeous little boy. It is astonishingly bad to look at this case and see the enormous gaps in provision for the protection of this little boy. I'd love to know your thoughts and feelings. I'm sure that you feel as incandescent with rage as I do regarding the outcome of what I've talked about today. I am glad that Thorla is gonna spend eternity in prison, essentially in this dimension, she deserves to. And like I say, whilst I doubt her narcissism is ever gonna be able to overcome her actual reality regarding the consequences of her actions to a point where she feels a level of remorse, I don't know. I really don't know. And it's kind of irrelevant because what matters is that people do love that little boy. His dad, his stepmom, his wider family, his auntie, they all care deeply about Eli. So he may have not been afforded the love from his mother that he deserved, but he was drenched in it by those who would have done anything and tried everything to save his life and to give him a happy future. Take care guys, I'm gonna dedicate this to Eli and also obviously the link below for the GoFundMe is there if you feel that you wanna to contribute to keeping his legacy alive. Take care, hug your kids a little bit closer tonight. Be safe.